In the last episode, we saw things begin to heat up in the west once again, as the Amago clan invaded Aki province in attempts to destroy the Morty clan. However, an intervention by the Ochi clan saw to a renewed alliance between the Ochi and the Mori, who would later launch an attack on the Amago citadel of Gasan Toda. The attack would drastically fail, however, resulting in massive casualties and causing Ochi Yoshitaka to lose his taste for war. This would cause his retainer, Sue Harukata, to begin planning to seize power from his stagnant lord. Now, as we move into the 1540s, right in the midst of the Sengoku Jidai, something completely unexpected would occur. Strange foreigners would begin arriving off the shores of Kyushu. Europeans had found Japan. It is easy to become comfortable with how things are, with how things have always been. Japan had only known its neighbors in Asia throughout its long history. Yet now, as the country was falling deeper and deeper into a chaotic period of war, foreigners from a land far beyond their known world would arrive on their shores, bringing with them new weapons and new ideas. Now, I'm going to do something I haven't done before. I'm going to hand things off here to my friend and colleague, Ian. Hello everyone, and thank you for having me. I invited Ian to help me with this video because he not only was the person who suggested I start this channel, but also because we share a love for history. What Ian is here to do is dive into what was going on in Europe at this time, in particular with the Portuguese Empire leading up to their expansion into the Far East. So without further ado, here he is to help explain Europe's arrival in Japan. In the wake of a great storm among the wreckage of a Canton trade vessel, on the beaches of Tanagashima lie strange men the likes of which had never before been seen in Japan. Who were they, and how did they get here? In order to understand who these strange foreigners were, we first need to look beyond Japan and examine the world of the Portuguese. In the wake of the Black Death, much of Europe remained depopulated and in shambles. With such a reduction in the European population, it goes without saying that the demand for exotic wares and commodities was significantly less than what it had been. In the early half of the 1400s, only a few links remained between Europe and the Far East, such as the Italian states of Genoa and Venice, who remained as intermediary traders with Muslim Egypt. It was Portugal's ambition to cut out the middlemen and establish direct routes between Europe and the Far East. However, being a relatively small, poor country situated in the far southwest corner of Europe, it seemed unlikely that Portugal would become the next great epicenter of global trade and exploration. That is, until the reign of Prince Henry the Navigator. During his reign, the Portuguese prince set out to establish a proper seafaring tradition in Portugal, which formed the catalyst that would propel the Portuguese advancements in map making, navigation, and shipbuilding. By doing so, Prince Henry laid the groundwork that would allow the great Portuguese explorers such as Vasco da Gama, Bartholomew Diaz and Alfonso Albuquerque to uncover those routes to the Far East and establish one of the greatest overseas empires of its time. First on the Gold Coast of Africa, then around the Cape of Good Hope and along the East African coast, India, the Spice Islands, and China. The Portuguese trade system centered around the establishment of Feitorias a series of fortified trade outposts constructed to conduct trade and protect Portuguese interests. Among the numerous feitorias established across Asia and the Far East, several ports of interest became critically important to Portugal's success. 
those being the ports of Aden, Goa, Malacca, Orbaz, and in the late 1550s, the settlement of Macau in southern China, all of which formed the route by which Portuguese traders would embark on multi-year trade voyages. Among the exotic and unusual commodities that could be found across Asia, spices were the thing that Portugal sought most, not for the sake of luxury, but out of great necessity. In Europe, the demand for spice became the driving factor of the Portuguese endeavor, particularly the demand of southern Europe, because of the need to preserve food and make it more palatable. Yet herein lied the problem. The Portuguese had neither the goods nor the mechanisms to trade for Asian spice, until it was realized that China had an insatiable appetite for silver. Realizing that by conducting inter-Asia trade to then buy silver to trade with China, Portugal could utilize the full extent of its empire to acquire as much silver as it could to trade for Chinese spice and other valuable goods to send home to Europe. Thus, Portugal began the process of sending enormous trade fleets to Asia to conduct these massive trade expeditions. Starting in Goa, the Portuguese vessels would bring with them a wealth of European goods. Continuing to other ports in India, they would acquire Indian goods such as gems, cinnamon, and pepper. Continuing on to Malacca and the Spice Islands, where they would stay for up to a year, waiting out the typhoon season and trading for aromatic woods and exotic animal hides. From Malacca, the traders would sail across the South China Sea to Macau to trade for silk and other Chinese goods. By the time the Portuguese had established their trade in the Far East, they began to realize the importance of this island nation known as Japan. Before now, the Portuguese had only known of Japan's existence through vague, second-hand reports from Marco Polo's expedition to the Far East in the 1270s. Japan was a land often known for its incessant piracy that had plagued the surrounding seas for years. However, it was common knowledge that Japan was home to a wealth of silver and other precious metals. Thus, the discovery of Japan was vital to the continued success of the Portuguese trade in the Far East. Yet, not knowing its exact location proved a conundrum in itself. As fate would have it in 1543, trader and explorer Antonio Moda's ship would be hit by a devastating storm, pulling them far off their initial course, resulting in the ship making landfall on an unknown island. This island was Tanegashima off of the southern coast of Kyushu. Tanagashima was ruled by the Lord Tanagashima Tokitaka, who was a retainer of the Shimazu clan, just north in Satsuma province. These foreigners intrigued Tokitaka, as their likes had never been seen before in Japan. But what truly caught his eye, however, were the arquebus guns these foreigners carried. Previously, Japan had known of crude firearms through their trade with China. However, these Chinese guns were not widely seen as reliable or effective. Upon seeing a demonstration of these new firearms, Tokitaka knew these were special. Initially, he attempted to have his master blacksmith emulate the design of the weapon, but to no avail. Eager to learn the secrets of these new weapons, Tokitaka sent his daughter to be with the foreigners so that he would be able to learn the secrets behind the construction of the firearms from her. Regardless, Tokitaka would have to wait until one year later, when Moda returned with skilled gun makers who were better able to teach the Japanese the proper skills of the trade. Thus, these new guns that were being produced on the island would come to simply be known as Tanegashima. In time, they would spread throughout Japan, and as more and more smiths began producing them across the country, the name of these weapons gradually shifted from Tanagashima to Tipo. Eventually, the Japanese would begin to refine and improve on the Portuguese designs, improving methods of manufacturing and solving problems that would take the empires of Europe decades to resolve. As more and more daimyo and samurai began finally getting their hands on Teipo, their use began to expand across the battlefield. However, discovering how to properly implement them was still under much debate. It would be 30 more years before Teipo would finally be introduced in a manner that would truly change the face of warfare in Japan. 
However, now the Japanese would be forced to face an influx of Jesuit missionaries who had been previously operating throughout the Far East, spreading the word of the Lord and converting the peoples of Asia. Although, now with the recent discovery of Japan, it was only a matter of time before they made their way to the shores of Kyushu. The first major introduction of Christianity to Japan came through the famous missionary Francis Xavier in 1549. Traveling to the Shimazu-controlled territory of Satsuma, where they were welcomed with open arms, most likely due to the idea that creating friendly ties with the missionaries may lead to greater trade opportunities with the Portuguese. Of course, this only worked to further the spread of Christianity throughout the country. In time as more missionaries began arriving in the country, many daimyo welcomed them into their homes, as having accepted a missionary's presence became a status symbol for some lords. However, this was not the case everywhere, as there were still many daimyo who viewed these men with hostility and their influence as toxic to Japanese ways. Although Francis Xavier's initial mission to Japan may have been one of simply spreading the word of the Lord and conversion of the Japanese people, eventually missionary work in Japan began to take a more political form, as their presence transformed into a conduit of Western influence. In the coming decades, more Europeans would come to Japan in search of trade and riches, most notably the Dutch. This new concept of the foreign empires of the West would forever change the future of Japan. So, what have we learned? The Portuguese need to find new avenues of trade led them to create a vast network of influence in the Far East, eventually leading them to the discovery of Japan. Upon landing in Japan, an interest in Western firearms began to fuel the new production of Japanese matchlock tipple. In time, the Japanese would come to innovate and transform their firearms to meet the needs of samurai warfare, although their actual implementation would remain under debate for some time. And lastly, with the gates to Japan now open, Jesuit missionaries would begin entering the country spreading the word of the Lord and the influence of the West. In the next episode, we return to the East as Takeda Shingen takes power, the Hojo are besieged at Kawagoe, and Uesugi Kenshin enters the fray. I want to say thank you to Ian for joining me on this episode and aiding me in discussing this extremely important moment in Japanese history. Thank you all for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.